Uh, welcome to our afternoon, our first afternoon panel uh, entitled The Worst of Times, The Frankfurt School and Contemporary Culture. I love this title. <laughs> um, just a bit of bureaucracy before we get started. Um, uh, right now, there's a learning session running on upstairs in parallel to this uh, uh, on traditional and critical theory. And at 2.10, uh, there's a, a seminar upstairs on uh, Freud and Adorno taught by Brooklyn Institute faculty, uh, Lauren Dent. Um, so hi, welcome again. Uh, it's nice to see people, uh, new faces uh, this, this afternoon and people from last night. This is very fun. Uh, my name, again, is Jay Singh Chawther. I'm the executive director of Brooklyn Institute and our core faculty member specializing in social and political theory. Um, and joining me uh, on the stage here, uh, I guess I'll go in order, but we won't necessarily speak in this order, is uh, to my immediate left, uh, again, not a political joke, uh, is Kate Wagner, who is a critic and journalist based in Chicago and Ljubljana, currently serving as architecture correspondent for The Nation. Uh, first known for her satirical blog, McMansion Hell, which, by the way, is fucking awesome. Uh, uh, Wagner has served as a columnist in the fields of architecture and culture, a number of publications, including The Baffler, Kirk, and New Republic. Uh, I'm actually going to skip this a little bit. Uh, when she's not writing and about the built environment, she writes about Slovenian cycling and learns Slovenian. And I recently had Slovenian wine and thought it was excellent. Uh, recently, Ms. Ms. Wagner also made her debut as a poet in the Slovenian publications Literatura and Versopolis. Um, to her left is Adam Schatz. Adam Schatz is the U.S. editor of the London Review of Books, a visiting professor at Bard College, and the author of Writers and Missionaries, Essays on the Radical Imagination. A very pertinent topic for today. Um, his book, The Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon, will be published by, in January by Farrar, Strauss, and Giro. To his left is Nathan Shields. Uh, Nathan Shields is a composer and a critic based in New York. He is also faculty here at Brooklyn Institute. Uh, he has written for The Baffler and other publications. Oh, there's a lot of Baffler writers up here tonight. Um, uh, and, other post and was a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow. He is associate faculty here at Bisser, teaching musicology and music theory. And finally, uh, all the way to my left, that kind of works, uh, is Izzy Litka, uh, who teaches at the intersection of politics and aesthetics with particular interests in 20th century avant-garde movements, critical theory, visual studies, and the politics of memory. She is... Oh, currently curating an exhibition on the Hungarian filmmaker and, and architect. I'm going to, oh, Laszlo Roik. Roik, thank you. Um, and she holds degrees from Princeton University and Oxford. So welcome, y'all. And we actually don't have a formal order. So I actually thought I would invite you, Adam, to start if you don't mind. Okay. And I'll do my spiel <laughs> sort of at the end. Why not? Let me put my reading glasses on. And uh, you know, first, I just want to thank uh, the Brooklyn Institute of Social Research and AJ for organizing this event. Um, and I, I wrote something up, I know, maybe something about the formality of the centenary of the Frankfurt School. Um, so in, in 1990, uh, a year after Fukuyama declared the end of history, Frederick Jameson wrote that the question about poetry after Auschwitz has been replaced with that of whether you could bear to read Adorno and Horkheimer next to the pool. <laughs> uh, Marxists in the academy in a, in a frenzy of anti-elitism were celebrating mass culture, writing odes to the subversiveness of Madonna or the transgressive pleasures of hardcore porn. The, the white German-speaking intellectuals at the Frankfurt School couldn't have looked more dead. Sure, there was new German critique, there was Telos already careening toward an iconoclastic conservatism under the influence of a very strong cocktail of Carl Schmidt. But Adorno and Horkheimer looked awfully old-fashioned with their denunciations of the authoritarian personality and their loathing of mass culture. Uh, not even Marcuse, the most radical of them all, the only surviving member to embrace the student movement, raided 
Sure, he'd been a member, a mentor to Angela Davis and young radicals in California had sat at his feet like Buddhists meeting the Dalai Lama, <laughs> but he was no match for Foucault. He didn't wear leather or take LSD or explore limit experiences in bathhouses, and the anti-Hegelian turn in social thought seemed to condemn him and everyone else to obsolescence. More than 30 years later, the end of history has ended, and both capitalism and liberal democracy have slid into crisis. Not just that, they've undergone an acrimonious divorce, notably in the very places where the wedding was celebrated in the early 90s. The authoritarian personality doesn't seem like a laughable archaism, of mid-century psychology. The world of surveillance capitalism may not be totally administered, as, to use Adorno's language, but it seems pretty damn close as we're steered by algorithms to buy things online or listened to by our phones, and don't tell me that's an illusion. Then there's the spread, the mainstreaming of racism, especially against Muslims and black people, but also against Jews and shady globalists, which has been very much facilitated by the culture industry. Who needs Father Coughlin's radio show when you have Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg? The questions the Frankfurt School thinkers were raising remain startling in their prescience. Why do we seem unable to imagine a relationship to nature that isn't destructive? Is our violent relationship to nature, the primacy we place on instrumental reason, linked to the way we treat one another and indeed the way we treat animals? Is liberalism with its belief in progress and the enlightenment a necessary defense against fascism and other forms of barbarism, or does it help to foster them? Is racism merely an ugly anti-modern atavism, or is it on the contrary, an essential ingredient in contemporary systems of domination? Why is technology that force which promises to liberate us made us feel and less free? Can art and culture help us to imagine alternatives to the world we inhabit? Why are they so easily absorbed into the system? Is AI the ultimate form of reification of our subjugation by what Richard Seymour has called the Twittering machine? Some of the writers of the Frankfurt School have never really gone out of style. Walter Benjamin, most obviously. He published immortal essays on Proust, Kafka, surrealism, photography. He died a martyr, which ended up burnishing his reputation. The Frankfurt School, most lyrical and enigmatic writer. He was a thinker with an insurgent imagination a bricoleur drawn equally to revolutionary Marxism and messianism. But what makes him most pertinent to today's concerns, I think, is his critique of the ideology of progress, which went hand in hand with his commitment to the victims of history. As he wrote in his great theses on the philosophy of history, the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. Everything in his work is a declaration of war against complacency. Adorno, as we know, lectured Benjamin, about the uh, lectured Benjamin about his great essay on the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. He thought Benjamin was fetishizing technology in a pre-Marxist sort of way. He also had problems with Benjamin's friendship with Brecht. Adorno was 10 years younger than Benjamin, but he wrote to him as if he were his father, or maybe his rabbi, leading him back to the right path. As many of you know, Adorno published a notorious and incredibly ill-informed attack on jazz. He's easy to parody, of course, a kind of Marxist Nick Drake, so depressed by the totally administered society that he sees no potential for resistance to it, except maybe in a performance of late Beethoven or Scherenberg, and would rather read Hegel than involve himself in politics. But whenever I read Adorno, I find his deeply brooding, intellectually probing, wonderfully sarcastic mind to be a tonic. So I'd like to quote some of my favorite Adorno aphorisms. I, I realize Adorno would be horrified by this kind of sampling, wrenching fragments from their original context. Then again, he also said that the whole is false. So here's my mixtape. <laughs> Every intellectual in emigration is without exception mutilated. For a man who no longer has a homeland, writing becomes a place to live. The recent past always presents itself as if destroyed by catastrophes. Even solidarity, the most honorable mode of socialist conduct, is sick. The idea that after this war, life will continue normally, or even that culture might be rebuilt, as if the rebuilding of culture were not already its negation, is idiotic. Normality is death. The notion of a message in art, even when politically radical, already contains an accommodation to the world. It is not the office of art to spotlight alternatives, but to resist by its form alone, the course of the world, which permanently puts a pistol to men's heads. Proofs that Jews are not a race will, in the event of a pogrom, scarcely alter the fact that the totalitarians know full well whom they do and do not intend to murder. <laughs> 
To assure a black person that he's exactly like the white man, which he, while he obviously is not, is secretly to wrong him still further. The melting pot was introduced by unbridled industrial capitalism. The thought of being cast into it conjures up martyrdom, not democracy. Personality scarcely signifies anything more than shining white teeth and freedom from body odor and emotions. <laughs> Bourgeois society makes the dissimilar comparable by reducing it to abstract quantities. Love is the power to see similarity in the dissimilar. Most of these lines are lifted from Adorno's masterwork, Minimum Moralia, composed in the mid-40s in the shadow of Auschwitz and of Benjamin's death. What you find here is a writer wrestling with some of the deepest questions about existence and the possibility of freedom and a non-mutilated life under modern capitalism. He writes with pungency, fury, and sorrow about the forces that threaten not just equality or decency, but also the capacity for individual thought and experience whose importance he insisted upon even as he posited their, their obsolescence. He wasn't a political revolutionary. He was frightened by the student rebels in Germany. But he was guided on the page where he continues to live by what Ernst Bloch called a principle of hope and believed society had to be measured by an exalted standard of justice. There's an ethics, I think, in Adorno, a hatred of cruelty and domination of all those who put a pistol to people's heads, a refusal of compromise with the reigning order, but also a refusal of the false consolations leavened by surprising flashes of humor, such as his line that, in psychoanalysis, nothing is true except the exaggerations. I wonder if something similar might be said about the Frankfurt School. I love its exaggerations, its outsized moods, its constant challenge to the sterile bureaucratic modes of thinking that have become a fixed feature of American liberalism, not least in the academy. Those exaggerations have provided a toolkit, as Gilles Deleuze might have said, for thinking about the nature of capitalist modernity and critical thought would be much poorer without them. Thanks. Uh, hey, do you wanna follow up? Is this on? Oh, it is. Okay. Of the handful of aphorisms and phrases Adorno devoted to... <laughs> yeah, this is perfect. This, this dovetails nicely. Devoted to architecture, at least to the concept of dwelling, about which he never wrote like a singular work. Uh, the one I find I most, I find most resonant is also from Minimal Moralia, which is where he says, it is part of morality not to be at home in one's home. It is clear Adorno is referring here to post-war Germany, to which he returned after his exile in America, and which he viscerally describes in the same text using the imagery of, bomb the imagery of bombed out houses, emigrants trying to rid themselves of the guilt of contributing to a housing shortage by staying in hotels, and the bungalow as a site of, quote, embalmment. The house, he wrote bitterly, is past. The sentiment resonates today. It is part of morality not to be at home in one's home. Are any of us, especially on the left, at home in our cruel, disintegrating heart of empire, in our overpriced apartments on which we are dependent on for shelter, while our ability to pay increasing rents only ensures that they will again go up? Are we at home in the frayed fabric of our cities, which become homogenized and unfamiliar to us, even though surely some of us come with the baggage of the term gentrifier? Our housing crisis is a mix of shortage and lack of affordability, originating, originating from the very concept of housing as a commodity, as an investment vehicle and as something from which its use and exchange values are severed from one another. Housing can also be understood as a relation between people and dwelling, between people and architecture and people in cities. And this relation, of course, through reification is transformed into a mere thing, an object. This invites a discourse of moral ambiguity we are presently navigating far worse than Adorno navigated his. I'm sure all of you here are familiar with the American iteration of the housing question, which has been in popular discourse reduced to a binary of something called YIMBY, which stands for yes in my backyard, versus NIMBY, which is defined by the opposition as those for who whatever reason are opposed to new development, even though these terms are so diluted they are borderline insipid. If we remove this cloak of terminology, we will see essentially what is a pro-market camp that speaks in terms of pro-housing as a cover for an indiscriminate fealty to development and a rhetoric of consumer choice in the way Hayek construed it, which is to say purchase in the market. A classic example of this perspective can be found in the debate around windowless bedrooms, which I wrote an essay about in The Nation, thank you, which are deemed necessary evils for solving the housing crisis and that someone is always willing to choose living in one in exchange for cheaper rent even though windowless bedrooms are miserable and there is no real choice in economic coercion. 
This camp has two enemies. One is revanchist protectionist suburbanites whose rhetoric is not far off from blood and soil and whose house values are girded by the marketeer's same prison of exchange value. These are the classical NIMBYs, anti-urban, anti-development, anti-progress, a kind of bulk but for home ownership. At the same time, you have vulnerable people at risk of displacement and critical bodies who are skeptical of the profit model in housing and those who see housing as a human right that must be separated from profit altogether if we want to see any long-lasting reduction of the housing burden. These are simplistic renderings of the debate that obscures what is in reality a spectrum encompassing many ideas. Some pro-market people, for example, are in favor of the idea of the government serving as a public developer of mixed income housing, and others are in favor of efforts that directly target affordability instead of supply, such as rent control. But I also think most of you are familiar, if you've ever been online, with the highly vitriolic, public-facing nature of this discourse. I think this is where Adorno is useful as a reference, specifically, specifically in his work on the culture industry. Recently, I wrote a yet published piece about aesthetics and the housing question for the drift. In reviewing texts claiming that we should not consider aesthetics or even livability in the housing question, even though aesthetics are inextricable from architecture, I found that in most of which is written, most of what is written by a certain sect of centrist pundit for whom a specific platform is key is namely Twitter. It's not only that Twitter is the site for these debates, it gives them their discursive shape and language. A typical example is Eric Leibitz's essay in New York Magazine called New Ugly, New <laughs> Freudian Slip. New luxury housing is good, actually. <laughs> a title bog, yeah, real Freudian slip, man. They could do a number on me there. A title barring the pithy combative language now synonymous with Twitter. Yeah. The substance of Levitz's essay, a response to a Bloomberg piece which reported that luxury buildings aren't quelling urban rents, is simple. True Yimbyism, which he defines as changing all residential land use to multifamily instead of single family and then building indiscriminately has never been tried and there is no correlation between <laughs> new buildings and rising rent. I should add that the sociological data on this is not conclusive but rather mixed and highly location dependent. This does not serve the pundit's service, you know. Um, but what's interesting about Levitz's essay is actually in his citation. While Levitz is keen to cite a variety of literature, including papers and articles in favor of his points, when he names his detractors in his exposition, he cites only Twitter and tweets. <laughs> this, for him, is the center of all discourse, the truest battlefield of ideas, which he then goes on to claim leaks into, quote, the serious world, where unfortunately, on occasion, some reporters will treat as a plausible analysis. This belittling and patronizing air is also borrowed from Twitter. Without Twitter, this essay and perhaps even this discourse would not exist. We can recognize Twitter's combative tone and attitude of owning one's enemies online in this discourse from the schema of mass culture. Let's take it as a given that the internet falls under Adorno's idea of mass culture, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. In his essay, Adorno almost perfectly describes pundits like Levitz in the mass culture context of their discourse. The he writes, the curiosity for information cannot be separated from the opinionated mentality of those who know it all. The curious individual becomes a nihilist. Anything that cannot be recognized, subsumed, and verified, he rejects as idiocy or ideology, as subjective in the derogatory sense. But what he knows becomes valueless in the process, mere repetition. This aporia of mass culture and the science affiliated to it reduces its victims to its own kind of practice, namely a blunted perseverance. For any of you who have been on Twitter, I'm sure this resonates with you. It is not that we just say, have an opinion, it's that we have to drill it in and own our enemies with it as many times as possible in as pithy a language as possible. <laughs> he then goes on to compare mass culture to sport, contests, and aptitude tests. The sensuous moment of art, he writes, which we will take here to mean architecture inherently tied to questions of housing, quote, transforms itself under the eyes of mass culture into the measurement, comparison, and assessment of physical phenomena. This is best expressed in the housing question in the fetishization of the unit and the number of units in housing discourse. So for me, what do I do here, right? The critic is in a very difficult spot, one Adorno recognize. Engage in the terms of my enemy, and I am anti-housing, full stop, immediately. But the critic, she also participates in the very society in which she takes issue. She is not at home in her own home. Culture for Adorno is a reflection of a society built on domination, on the lack of real freedom from which we can only be liberated through real political liberation from the shackles of capitalism. I don't want to get in the weeds here on things like transcendent and imminent critique, but this is an important distinction because the conservative view of criticism, an aesthetic moralist one promoted at this very instant by the right in architecture, is that art has been corrupted by materialist society and thus must be cleansed and returned to a kind of purity. 
consider on the one hand Trump's make federal architecture beautiful again mandate as an example of this, but also one of the most commonly cited essays in relation to housing and architecture, Heidegger's building dwelling thinking in which he laments that dwelling has only been reduced to building and construction rather than one's way of being in the world in relation to all of its locative elements, something he compared to poetry. This perspective, the scholar Matt Wagner, no relation, and rightly, thanks to Heidegger, rightly links to Heidegger's ability to continue living and working in Nazi Germany during the war, whereas Adorno was forced into exile. To make things personal, in my conclusion, recently I find myself in a kind of exile as well, an exile anyone familiar with the immigration process knows well, the exile of bureaucratic waiting to return to their country of choice. In my case, an expired passport has thwarted the progress gained in 10 months, 10 really humiliating months spent securing temporary residence status in Slovenia a process in which the freedom of my movement has nothing to do with choice. While not subjected to war or persecution, in order to be deemed worthy of living somewhere else, my life is contingent on either the institutions of employment or marriage. Adorno recognized this when he was right, this false choice when he was writing on homelessness and no man's land in minimal moralia. At the same time, I live in Chicago, lease an expensive apartment and released it because the rent is not going up, another non-choice. I choose, however, to participate in all American processes of commerce, Yet we live in society, as the meme goes. <laughs> <laughs> if I moved to a different neighborhood for cheaper rent, I would choose to be a gentrifier. Yet at the same time, I'd also decided to delete Twitter from my phone. In doing this, now, first of all, all of this discourse has disappeared. In fact, you will not actually see it in any other publications. You will not see it in like the public eye. Its, rela its reliance on Twitter is complete and total. And second, I'm able to no longer subject myself to hours of needless conflict and abuse, and I'm able to see what is a central issue in architecture more clearly and with less fear of rabbit combat. <laughs> For Adorno, quote, the dialectical critic of culture must both participate in culture and not participate. Only then does he do justice to his object and himself. For the rest of us, that maybe means shopping at Target, but maybe it also means logging off. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Nathan, do you, do you like to... Oh, yes, you did. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, is this on? Uh, yeah, it's on. <laughs> okay. Um, They're very directional. All right. Um, so, we have the bigger design. Not it's not working. Not on. Why don't you just use that? Just use that. All right. Okay. Yes. Now I can hear myself. Thank you. So, as Ajay mentioned, I am Bisser's kind of a associate faculty teaching musicology and music theory. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of Adorno and music today and how we can kind of help us think about music now. And in some ways, this is a kind of counterintuitive case to be making, because you could say, on the one hand, uh, Adorno has already been immensely influential, a huge amount of uh, academic musicology for the past, you know, 60 years has been footnotes to Adorno in a certain sense. So why is it necessary? On the other hand, you could say is kind of um, bringing Adorno's musical thought to bear desirable. He has famously some very bad opinions, notably on jazz. Uh, he is kind of often derided as a snob who would you know, rather stay at home and you know, listen to uh, uh, Schoenberg. And you know, as someone who would also rather stay home and listen to Schoenberg, I'm maybe not like the best positioned to defend him on this count, but I would like to argue that um, as kind of much as Adorno's particular aesthetic battles may seem to belong to the past, as much as he may have been wrong about very particular things, I think there are very, there are two reasons in which he is uh, still really present and vital for us today. Uh, the first, first of these uh, concerns, you could say, the question of Adorno's method, his way of thinking about music, his understanding of music, uh, you know, over and sometimes against some of his particular conclusions. Uh, what Adorno offers us, above all, is a way of thinking about music that it is, on the one hand, it is not treated as something that is kind of purely transcendent, kind of in the capital R romantic sense out there um, in the kind of platonic realm of the forms divorced from the real world of society, of everyday struggles, of the suffering people who create it. Music is part of the world. It is, it is imminent. 
But music is not as I think it has been treated, particularly in like much kind of modern criticism. Music is not, you could say, epiphenomenal. It is not purely the product of um, the social drives, the relations of power, the industries that produce it. It has a kind of partial autonomy. It has a reality as a form of art. Um, uh, another way to think about it is that music is not purely product and it's not purely propaganda. There is always something beyond um, its relationship to its immediate material conditions. Um, and in this way, you could say Adorno thinks about music uh, always dialectically, always holding in mind both its dependence upon the world and its ability to kind of stand outside the world and um, at times to criticize it. And I wanted to think about this a little bit by relation to a, a very kind of thorny but beautiful passage from Adorno's um, essay on Beethoven's kind of late style. And think about this passage, um, which I'm actually teaching tomorrow, <laughs> as a way of trying to kind of open up the question of how Adorno thinks about music more broadly. So this is, I mean, this is beautiful, aphoristic. It is very dense. So I'm going to, so try and like hold all of this in your head as I recite it. Um, so he's talking essentially about the question of um, what it means to, for Beethoven to have this late style musically that develops in his last works, what kind of distinguishes it from a lot of the earlier works. And when we think about the late music of an artist, there's this kind of paradox that Adorno notes, which is that the later we get, the more we kind of um, tend to almost unthinkingly view the art as biography, as he says that art takes up um, residence in the vicinity of the document. That instead of thinking it as, thinking of it again, as art, as this thing that has been wrought, that has been created, that kind of has an internal meaning, uh, we tend to think of it as, in some straightforward way, a kind of portrait of um, the artist, of his or her suffering, um, particular place in the world, you know, uh, sort of the physical ailments. Uh, and this is, in a way, a very, again, a very 19th century romantic view that he's militating against, but it is, I think, now also a very contemporary view, and I want to come back to this point. So he's trying to think then about Beethoven's late work as against this kind of biographical conception of it. And he's trying to think in particular about the really strange quality in late Beethoven of the music's relation to convention. The way in which Beethoven, who in his kind of middle period music seems in a way it's radically innovative, everything is kind of new, self-contained, the music is an organic whole. In the late work, you have these fragments of old styles that just kind of reappear out of nowhere and kind of take over. You have, um, in some ways, a seemingly kind of more um, amenable relationship to convention and even to sort of the banal, and you have all these strange discontinuities. discontinuities. So this is the background for this passage. Uh, he says, this sheds light on the nonsensical fact that the very late Beethoven is called both subjective and objective. Objective is the fractured landscape. Subjective, the light in which, alone, it glows into life. He does not bring about their harmonious synthesis as the power of disassociation. He tears them apart in time in order, perhaps, to preserve them for the eternal. In the history of art, late works are the catastrophes. And this is, I mean, to me, this is like one of the most kind of fruitful, generative passages in 20th century music criticism. You have a, a huge amount of thinking, including like by a, a whole book by Edward Said that kind of comes out of this image of the late work as catastrophe. And, but moving back from this question of kind of late style per se, I want to think a little bit about like, what is the picture of music we get here? Um, and among other things, there is just this tremendous, this re refusal of any kind of reduction or false simplicity. Adorno, when presented with an either or, Adorno always kind of insists on both. But the music is, you know, he says, he tears them apart in time in order to preserve them for the eternal. The music is, in one sense, timely. It is a product of Beethoven's world. On the other hand, it is something that persists in kind of standing outside of it, preserving something beyond the immediate world um, for eternity. And it is 
Also, a social product, but at the same time, a kind of partially autonomous artwork, something that obeys its own laws, and crucially, something that happens to us. Art has its own sort of dignity, and the encounter with the work of art is an encounter that is not just a kind of vision of ourselves, but that takes us beyond um, our immediate self-understanding. And in this way, art, and he says, uh, this vision of like art as catastrophe, Art has, or music has, the capacity to stand as a kind of prophetic negation. It says no um, to the world in which we are, and in that way, it kind of helps us to imagine something beyond it. And this is, you know, in a way you can recognize here, not just Adorno's understanding of late Beethoven, but very vividly his vision of what music means at its deepest. His entire understanding of modernism, in some ways, is contained kind of uh, in Nuce in this uh, portrait of late Beethoven. And I think particularly one of the quotes that uh, Adam cites is that art resists by its form alone the course of the world. In other words, art is not about content primarily. Art is about the shape of the experience that we have with it and the way in which that shape can, however temporarily, however fleetingly, uh, change us. Now, um, You think about, what does this mean for us now? On the one hand, uh, I think, why is Adorno necessary? We could say if a lot of musical thought has um, been, had this kind of paternal relationship, the Adorno has been the father of a lot of musical thought, that relationship has been in some senses Oedipal. And there are two aspects particularly of Adorno that we have, I think, kind of lost and that are worth kind of bringing back. Now, the first of these is, I mean, very straightforwardly, his skepticism toward mass culture, toward the culture industry. A lot of thought, particularly in academic musicology, which was kind of where a lot of the sort of self-declared heirs of Dorno were, um, kept his mode of thinking, I think often very fruitfully, um, but very much abandoned the kind of skepticism that underlay it. And, uh, in fact, I mean, the Adam mentions, you know, uh, theorists in like the 80s and 90s writing about kind of like the, liber uh, the sort of liberating power of Madonna. This is, this is sort of where a lot of uh, self-professed Adorno musicology was um, a couple decades ago, and that legacy is still very much with us. Now, in some ways, just as importantly, there has been, you know, sometimes opposed or sometimes, sometimes opposed to or sometimes allied with the first trend, has been a kind of almost complete loss of the sort of Adornian understanding of aesthetic autonomy, however partial or provisional, that um, that has been kind of rejected in some ways as a kind of old romantic dogma. And in response, we've returned instead to a world in which once again, art is seen as biography. It takes up um, residence in the proximity of uh, the document. And this has left us in a way with a critical landscape that is to a great degree dominated on the one hand by sort of poptimism and on the other hand by an almost completely kind of a ad hominem or ad feminin understanding of what art is. Art is the document of the individual, whether of their particular sufferings or of their kind of group membership. And uh, this is in some ways I think left us increasingly powerless both to think about mass culture critically and to understand art really as aesthetic experience rather than as document. And in both of these respects, I think Adorno still has a lot to teach us. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, and Izzy, last but not least. Hello, okay, this is still. Um, thank you all for these wonderful comments. I wanted to reflect today on some of the um, anxieties that both the production and reception of cultural commentary as, as a kind of cultural object um, tends to elicit. And here I mean uh, criticism understood in its most kind of colloquial sense, right? A commentary on the visual and performing and literary arts and the discussion that it often elicits exemplified in kind of the contemporary superstructural phenomenon uh, that sometimes goes by the name, the discourse. Um, 
And I thought a lot about cultural commentary as, as a cultural object this year for two reasons. Um, one, in the course of uh, With Ajay recording uh, our podcast, uh, Pop Cultural Marxism for, for Bisser, um, we've spoken a lot about the ways that aesthetic judgment um, has been supplanted by, by certain forms of moral judgment, um, something close to what Nate was just describing, right? About um, art as a kind of reflection of biography. Um, or um, by what we kind of called in our discussion forensic analysis, right? Um, this tendency to see all cultural texts as investigative documents that, that sort of are puzzles to be solved, right? Um, and the way that sort of cultural production itself has leaned into this by, for instance, um, um, deliberately including Easter eggs, right, in television shows um, for a long time sort of fans of fran franchises so that they feel as though they're sort of part of something. Um, or, you know, in the admission of certain directors that they regularly read fan forums to see um, whether, you know, they're correctly guessing what, what, what's, about, what's going to happen. Um, and the second reason I've been thinking a lot about cultural commentary as a, as a, as a, as a cultural form is that um, reading Frankfurt School texts in the company of my students this year, um, I've been struck at how open they've been about their kind of affective responses to these texts. Um, the frustrations, um, the pleasures, but also definitely the frustrations of reading works that demand a different kind of attention um, and a capacity to dwell in contradiction, um, in contrast to the relationship with cultural objects that that the most common forms of criticism seem to call for and that they encounter are sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, a passage that, that I assigned at the beginning of my Jameson class is instructive here, and it goes as follows. This is from um, Jameson's Introduction to Marxism and Form. Nowhere in the, is the hostility of the Anglo-American tradition toward the dialectical more apparent than, than in the widespread notion that the style of these works is obscure and cumbersome, indigestible, abstract, or to sum it all up in a convenient catchword, Germanic. <laughs> it can be admitted that it does not conform to the canons of clear and fluid journalistic writing taught in schools, but what if those ideals of clarity and simplicity have come to serve a very different ideological purpose in our present context from the one Descartes had in mind? What if in this period of overproduction of the printed matter and the, pro and the proliferation of methods of quick reading, they were intended to speed the reader across a sentence in such a way that he can salute a ready-made idea effortlessly in passing without suspecting that real thought demands a descent into the materiality of language and a consent to time itself in the form of a sentence. In the language of Adorno, perhaps the finest dialectical intelligence, the finest stylist of them all, density is itself a conduct of intransigence. The bristling mass of abstractions and cross-references is precisely intended to be read in situation against the cheap facility of what surrounds it as a warning to the reader of the price he has to pay for genuine thinking. I'm going to pour myself a glass. Um, so while I don't sort of necessarily agree with, with Jameson's characterization of Adorno's prose, um, I do think there's something important here in thinking about the task of critical theory today um, in terms of the need to elaborate, what, what I think that Fra the Frankfurt School tradition provides us is a way of elaborating the conditions in which saluting a ready-made idea effortlessly in passing has kind of become a normatively desirable cultural attitude, right? Um, the Frankfurt School tradition, I think, can give us an account of, um, for one, the structural conditions and economic logics and, and pedagogical practices even that kind of account for a cultural sphere defined by the mandate to render like a firm and unequivocal judgment on a work's success or failure. Um, it can give us an account of the anxieties and affective responses common in the world of contemporary cultural commentary. Um, so we can think, for instance, of the phenomenon of sort of people defending um, uh, culture, uh, defending um, like film franchises like Marvel or Disney, Disney as though they're the little guy, right? Um, critical theory makes legible what's happening here beyond a sort of simply anti-intellectualism explanation, right? Um, it asks us to imagine what kind of world makes such actions both imagine imaginable as progressive for people 
and perhaps to see these kinds of attitudes as symptomatic of really the diminished possibilities for cultural, for independent cultural production today. Um, perhaps reflecting fears, however misplaced, that that um, uh, of the sort of of that that certain forms of culture are so precarious that they can't even withstand criticism. Um, it can give us an account of the recent, I think, celebration of a sort of deliberately cultivated uh, self-protective shallowness as expressed in this idea we often find that it's not that deep, right? How many times have we seen it's not that deep kind of, um, yeah, don't overthink it. Um, or um, even an account of the sort of um, people's increasing comfort with aesthetic judgments that by definition don't require any kinds of um, uh, articulation, right? So think about people um, uh, describing the vibe of a cultural object or the aesthetic of a cultural object, right? Um, this is supposed to be sort of, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, sort of self-explanatory, right, on its face. Um, and finally, it can give us an account of how, um, and as Kate mentioned this as well, those sort of critical dispositions these kinds of critical dispositions are shaped in part by the technological and communicative infrastructure in which we find ourselves, right? Um, there is a relationship between the, uh, the form, the, the, the actual um, infrastructure of Twitter and the kinds of discursive practices that, that emanate from it. And I think that the um, uh, critical theory tradition gives us the explanatory tools to think through that. Um, and, in addition to all of this, um, I think an analysis of cultural commentary as an object also gives us a task as, as critical theorists, right? It's also a provocation, I think, to critical theory to take pedagogy seriously. Um, and to, uh, here I'm reminded of the, um, a line in, in the extraordinary French filmmaker Chris Marker's 2084, um, one way of acquiring new certainties is to learn how to doubt together. Um, and we should ask how it is that we as teachers kind of convene, can convene people in ways that enable them to learn to doubt together. Um, that film, as it happens, was also a centenary anniversary. Um, it was commissioned by the French Democratic Confederation of Labor in 1984 uh, to celebrate the centenary of the French trade union movement. And, you know, it's this wonderful film that sort of offers three possible versions of life in a hundred years time, um, three different um, sort of fates of trade unionism. Um, and it ends with um, a line that I want to um, quote to you kind of by way of conclusion. Um, this is just our way, Marker says, uh, of celebrating the centenary of trade unionism, speaking not of what unionism has done, but what it has still to do. And provided we hurry a little, it'll just take another century. <laughs> Thank you so much, Izzy. Um, I'll try to be brief, just adding a few comments uh, before uh, hopefully launching us into sort of just a uh, conversation and crosstalk. Um, I'm so happy you brought up the podcast. Uh, as part of the sort of uh, mandate of this panel, I suppose, uh, uh, was uh, the sort of question of like, you, you know, how much of this material can we still use today, right? Uh, to put it ugly in a, in a way that Adorno would hate it, right? Um, you know, is, is it applicable? Is it dated? Yada, yada. And so, of course, in some ways, you know, uh, you have to reach for new materials, new iterations. Um, but yeah, I, I, I actually wanted to start by sort of referencing that uh, Rebecca and I did, so Rebecca's over there, hi Rebecca, uh, I think like what, 60, 70 podcasts, and we'll pick it up again in the fall, um, of, of contemporary music criticism and uh, dealing with everything from like pop, me contemporary pop music all the way back to like Baroque composition, <laughs> uh, like in different episodes, and often leveraging often against our own will. Like sometimes we would like want to rely on a theorist that was more contemporary, but we wind our way back to Benjamin or Adorno. Um, and similarly, uh, um, I was thinking about this a lot, Izzy, with our, with our uh, collective uh, podcast, um, because there's a way in which, when I first started teaching this material uh, to like Columbia undergrads in the mid aughts, um, people thought like the culture industry and stuff was like dead as a doornail. 
I mean, what Adam said there is actually an understatement. Um, and it just, it switched in like the matter of like maybe five to 10 years to where my students, um, whether they were 18 year olds at Columbia or sort of like 25 to 50 year olds at Brooklyn Institute were like, oh my God, no, 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 this describes my world as I live it every day. And there are certain aspects of that essay that are so much more like actually alive and pernicious today than like, then they would have applied in that day. Like when, when Adorno writes about the studio system, like MGM and stuff like this, like not in the faintest inkling of his mind could you imagine a media conglomerate like Disney, right? At the end of the culture industry, he writes about uh, films being an advertisement for it, but the final form of commercial cinema is the film that just advertises the next film, which is literally the Disney model. <laughs> um, and now everyone tries to ape it because it's so lucrative. And then I also think uh, he, the classic setup is the budget and the box office proves the value of the, the art. And our very first episode was on the most expensive television show of all time, uh, Jeff Bezos' Starling Project, which is the billion dollar adaptation of a footnote from Lord of the Rings. Um, and the only thing that makes this a notable aesthetic text, if you even want to call it such a thing, is that it costs a billion dollars. Every other aspect of it is a complete and utter failure. And the thing that's really fascinating to me about this is um, in Adorno's own lifetime, and I'm here I'll talk about Adorno. I mean, you can also talk about Horkheimer and Benjamin and uh, Marcuse. I'll talk about Benjamin again. Uh, but in Adorno's own lifetime, you know, we, we tend to think of him as a real stick in the mud, right? And also very sort of hands off from empirical work. Uh, but one of his last essays was actually a revisit of the culture industry. It's called Free Time. It's from, I think, 1967, 68. I'm not going to read them. I bought them all with me just in case people want it. Um, and he's like, actually, we went out and tested it. We surveyed them to people watching TV to see if, if we were right. And like, it turns out, that like, it's both yes and no. Like on the one hand, so uh, I think the experiment was about, um, uh, it's actually very funny, it's happened again, was people watching the crowning of, of one of the royals of Northern Europe. And um, on the one hand, uh, everyone they surveyed was aware that this was in fact an ideological spectacle that in their own terms, and this is actually properly, if you know your sociological methods, it's like properly blocked statistically and all that stuff. But at the same time, they also registered that they felt compelled to participate and watch, right? And that sort of kind of compulsion like I think really is one of the lasting aspects. And I think it speaks to Twitter, it speaks to things that people have been raising already um, that last so well. And also, of course, the way in which um, capitalism has proved so successful in sort of absorbing material. And here I think not only Adorno actually writes himself of his own favorites, Schoenberg, et cetera, becoming absorbed already. Uh, he writes about literature as well, Kafka, uh, Proust, et cetera. Um, but I also think of um, uh, this book, uh, uh, I brought it with me, uh, Blues Legacies and Black Feminism by Angela Davis. Um, and she talks about this as well in a different sort of bond right? It's, again, it's very critical theoretical. So she uh, argues on the one hand that the sort of space of Black music, and especially as it was tied to the church, created a, like an autonomous sphere from which political imagination and political activism could proceed, right? Sounds great. But it also came with a bunch of uh, obvious constraints within the system of Christianity, right? So it becomes then a tether and a sort of, I, I don't use stronger language than that, a tether or a bind on the sort of progress of these kinds of political movements. This is a classically critical theoretical argument. Um, and I won't go on too much longer. I, I just want to say two other things and I'll, I don't want to shift to questions. Uh, the, la the, the other thing that's so funny thinking about Twitter and thinking about um, dissemination and circulation, when, I, uh, when Spotify came out, 
I started using this in my intro critical theory classes because it used to have a, I don't think of you it anymore. It used to have an infinite scroll feature. I don't know if everyone knows what this is, but like if you just scrolled Spotify enough, it, yeah, it would start generating these categories. So yeah, I don't know if you've seen this, but like, wait, the, at the top, it says like pop jazz, classical. In fact, now it's much worse. And they have like moods. It's like happy, sad, energized, whatever. Um, sporty. Yeah, vibes. Um, but if you keep scrolling, it starts generating the most crazy specific categories. So like for me, for example, it would scrape data on your like, identity. So it would be like, Desi pop music influenced by classical, like, or like, it'd be like Mexican party music for women. And you're like, what? Like, no, I'm not even joking. You can still find this Spotify. And the brilliant thing about this is, right, it really juxtaposed that sort of 90s poptimism, techno optimistic moment with the dread that uh, early critical theory had. Because, and actually, it's so many students who were like, like you could see their like, I don't know what it is, their heart dropping or something. Cause they were like, oh fuck. Like on the one hand, right? This looks like incredible progress. Instead of it just being one unified, right? Adorno was wrong, right? Uh, there's not just one unified world of cultural production. There's a million things, but it has to fit in a Spotify playlist. It has to be scrapable and deliverable in a nice, neat cube that you can stream, very poor quality, I might add, uh, on your computer or headphones or phone or whatever. And this is the point, right? Every, you can be free to be anything in art as long as you can fit into a Spotify channel. So the last thing I want to say, which is a, a little bit pointed, and I think maybe uh, connects more to what we were talking about last night, is... In many ways, uh, you know, alongside the revival of critical theory, interest in critical theory has been a much broader um, revival of interest in Marxist thought in general. And I think this is, to me, very salutary. But one of the sad things about this is that the kind of taking seriously cultural criticism and aesthetic judgment has often been sidelined as sort of like fake or like, immaterial or a sideshow or even heretical, right? To like the real work of sort of political economic analysis, class organization, things like this. And I think it's one of the things that thinking about um, critical theory hundred years later uh, is so helpful is like, why, if you are identified on the left, like why this self lobotomy? We've gone through so many political events in the past 10 years in which the media, in which culture, in which uh, dissemination, in which ideology has been crucial. And yet we end up with arguments that ignore all of those things. Um, so, and I'll end with a funny anecdote on this and then switch into questions, which is um, I just finished teaching a course on Mark Fisher, um, who protests to no end that he is not an Adorno guy, <laughs> but is so obviously like the lady doth protest too much, you know what I mean? Like he's really he actually is kind of an Adorno guy. Um, and <laughs> oh God. Um, uh, one of the anecdotes I'll start that class with is um, two of the kids that started the uh, Starbucks union, speaking of organized labor, met because they saw each other reading a book uh, by Fisher. Not his famous work of political theory, not capitalist realism, but in fact, his like one of his more formal books on music criticism, um, Ghosts of My Life. So, right, you can actually see here that the int like this is like the original OG Frank Fiscal argument. Like elements of culture and cultural analysis are vital for the formation of any form of political consciousness. So on that note, I actually want to sort of throw things back to the group. Um, and there were so many wonderful things that came up across these conversations. Um, Adam, you hit almost all of my favorite bangers from Minimum Rally, except one, uh, which is the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass, which is one of my favorite lines from Adorno for two reasons. I think this could be a nice place to start. 
Um, one, it's right, this wonderful inversion of the Christian aphorism, right? Uh, take the sponge of your eye first, right? And I get my Christianity mixed up sometimes. Um, but right, the, you're never going to get, this is like part of critical theory as method, right? The splinter is always there. And in fact, Adorno's splinter probably is just. <laughs> Um, and uh, sort of fun fact, I was uh, once a, a jazz musician. Uh, Adorno did not listen to any good jazz. Adorno listened to the worst. He listened to like Benny Goodman playing like the Benny Goodman version of rocking the classics, basically like, swinging Mozart. It was atrocious, but that is his fault. Like he could have picked up some Mingus or some Trey. Yeah, exactly. And been like, oh, actually, um, this, stuff is, this is exactly what I want music to do. Um, but right, the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass. And I'm wondering how we can think about that as like, right, we all participate, right, in cultural production, in cultural criticism. And as both Adam and, and Kate really emphasize, right, in sort of like social media mediated conversations. And I'm wondering how we think uh, like across all of us, like what is the role of this kind of that structure of argument? Kate and I directly address this, but I want to give us a little more space for how we think about and shape cultural criticism today. So broad question, who wants to take it on? Oh, no one does. I mean the structure of social media, oh. and uh, you can use Twitter as the principle of it. Although Facebook's got its own wild dynamics, I mean, it, there's so much you could do. There's a quote from the culture industry that I did not read, but I think really sums up like the kind of behavior in which this is uh, encouraged. And Adorno writes about like the person who participates in mass culture, right? Who was subsumed by it. Uh, he, he finds himself dependent upon information when his own experience proves inadequate, and the apparatus trains him to appear well-informed on pain of losing prestige among other people and to renounce it the more arduous process of real experience. And this goes back to our, our, what Issy was saying about art as this kind of like autonomous thing that has some autonomy from just not just like moralism or not just from biography or what have you. If mass culture has already become one great exhibition, then everyone who stumbles into it feels as lonely as a stranger on an exhibition site. This is where information leaps in the endless, uh, this is where information leaps in. The endless exhibition is also the endless bureau of information which forces itself upon the hapless visitor and regales him with leaflets, guides, and radio recommendations, sparing each individual from the disgrace of appearing as stupid as everyone else. Mass culture is a signal, system of signals that signals itself. Yeah, it's brutal. But like, I think this is especially true of like the algorithmic behaviors of social media, which is really kind of the Ouroboros of the snake eating its own tail, right? Where it's like, you wouldn't have this discourse without Twitter, but like this discourse exists because of Twitter, because of the apparatus of Twitter that farms engagement and encourages conflict. And so... The funny thing is, is that, so when I was in graduate school, I studied mostly thinkers from the 60s and 70s because this was the period in which I was working. So I was working with like, for example, Baudrillard or in architecture to furry or in, um, yeah, Bart, you know, for example. And one of the things I find really interesting about the Frankfurt School is the kind of way in which they're willing to be combative about the things that, because there's a lot of equivocation in those texts from the 70s. There's a lot of like trying to balance like a nascent postmodernism, right? Which in architecture took on an explicitly populist form, um, which it didn't take in, in fields like philosophy, for example. Um, and I think the more I see the discourse that happens on social media, the more I recognize these kinds of, of postmodern forms, these faux populisms, the marvel is mythology, the, any of these things. And it's like people, a populism appeals to people because if they feel that, for example, it's, it speaks for them or, or the, it gives them justification for like the things that they like that are trash. And it's like, I like a lot of things. Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm just gonna say. It's like, I really like some real trash in this world. Um, and, but the thing I liked about, I always liked about Adorno is he was able to thread this needle in a way that it was like, yes, like I said, like the critic does not exist like outside of culture. Like 
they are complicit in culture. And this gives us like some liber some liberation, I think, yeah. both in social media and in real life that like, yeah, we are, we have our own, you know, separate takes and we are like, of course, complicit in all of these systems or whatever. But that doesn't mean that we can't engage with them in, in like a way that is, not, if not dialectical, then at least, you know, sharp. So I guess that's my really long answer here. It's good, it's good. Uh, anyone else uh, interested in addressing social media more? No, maybe not. Nathan, it looks like you're a little bit off. <laughs> oh, I guess we have one. Yes. Hello. All right. So, uh, what I, I mean, particularly like by reference to Adorno and the Frankfurt School, what um, and what strikes me, I suppose, about social media is the way in which it kind of uh, takes a lot of these kind of dynamics that uh, the Frankfurt School thinkers discuss of the kind of instrumentalization of our relationships with each other and internalize it. Um, I mean. It's, Fundamentally, uh, social media thrives on this kind of dynamic of turning oneself into a kind of commodity, a cultural commodity that is um, sort of produced and consumed in this kind of simulacrum of uh, the public sphere <laughs> that is no longer actually a public sphere. Um, so there is uh, something I've wrestled with a lot, I think, is the way in which that dynamic of social media then becomes a kind of an intrinsic part of the kind of actual cultural production that most of the people who are on social media kind of hawking their wares produce. Uh, we, we write differently, we kind of think differently, and I think we kind of create music differently because of the way that we have instrumentalized ourselves. And there is particularly the, uh, the transformation of the artwork into a kind of hook for the product that is the or person. It's like, it's your, like, your brand identity. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like the brand identity is is now the thing, and any individual artwork just becomes an expression of that brand identity. <laughs> yes. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like a, no form, just content. <laughs> that that sounds like like a like a like a trademark for like a new platform. <laughs> um, I no, I, I would very much second what you were just saying, Nathan, about the self-commodification uh, that goes on in, in, in social media. But I wanted to add one more, an, another aspect that touches on a different area of um, Frankfurt School thought, particularly the analyses of fascism and the authoritarian personality. And, and that is the fact that social media has become this arena for uh, trolling, brutalization, shaming, um, just a place where all the, the sort of darkest undercurrents um, in our culture are, are on display. Um, and, I, and I've occasionally been a, a target of that too. So um, I, I know well know that experience rather well. But I, I, I want to um, push back a little bit against some of the, um, uh, the Frankfurt School's uh, hyperbolic, monolithic understandings of mass culture. Um, in a sense, I'm, I'm returning to some themes that um, Nathan explored in his talk about the uh, partial autonomy of, um, of the art object and the struggle of individual creators, whether at the beginning of their careers and when they're, when they're making their, their late work um, to uh, express themselves. Um, you know, Jameson um, in I think uh, uh, an essay in um, that wonderful uh, Verso collection published in the late 70s, the debates on modernism between Lukacs and Bloch and uh, Benjamin Nadorno, uh, noted that, the, uh, uh, that, that it was a semi-miracle for Adorno to posit the semi-autonomy of, uh, of the artist because almost his, his entire analysis would seem to preclude that, right? Um, and yet he does, and it's not romantic, and it's not um, it's not a, a, a stiff formalism, um, as as you were saying. Although it's sometimes been mistaken for that. But what strikes me is that he's capable of extending that partial liberty, that kind of ephemeral 
um, emancipation um, in a late Beethoven sonata or in, in a work by Scherenberg, even if they are incorporated later on. But he doesn't extend that same semi-autonomy to artists who might be working in a sphere that could be described as mass culture. And I'll tell you an anecdote, an anecdote that's always um, that I think of often. I was um, having dinner with some uh, writer friends who were uh, in there you know, a bit, bit older and, and very much influenced by um, writers like the, the Frankfurt School, but also I think uh, Clement Greenberg, who you know, is another father figure who had to be slayed. I mean, in a sense, you know, the relationship between Clement Greenberg and, and people like Rosalind Krauss is very similar to the relationship between Adorno and musicologists like Susan McClary. And um, this uh, person I was having dinner with um, made it plain that she had not seen uh, The Wire and she would never see it because nothing that comes out of mass culture could ultimately be, any val be of any value. You could not produce art within, within mass culture. And I, I, I asked whether she'd ever heard uh, Kendrick Lamar. Um, no, because hip hop is a creation of mass culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right, yeah, no, exactly. And, um, so th that seems to me to be a real, a kind of a real limitation of the, the Frankfurt School prism for thinking about mass culture, because actually some of the most interesting things going on today are taking place in what the Frankfurt School would have derided as mass culture. And, to, and in some ways, the things that are taking place in high culture are often a far less interest. Fair. Um, it actually reminds me of this of also something that I think it gets lost so much. I mean, A, of course, Benjamin is, is the sort of counter voice in this conversation. And you mentioned that uh, Adorno takes that almost professorial uh, attitude. Of him. The irony being, of course, that Benjamin historically was in fact Adorno's, one of Adorno's teachers. Um, Adorno's first job as like an adjunct, a private docent in Germany was teaching Benjamin's work, <laughs> uh, the same work that had been rejected as his habilitation thesis. Um, but of course, by the counter argument that Benjamin makes is there is promise in mass art, in mass media um, that's ever so slightly different. It's actually a very, as Kate and I were talking about earlier, a very architecturally informed theory, right? That like you sort of unconsciously are dwelling within that space of media and avant-garde effects can still happen. And I think the example of someone like Kendrick Lamar, we're gonna play some music later. And I, I don't think Kendrick Lamar is on there, but I think like a Kanye Rihanna track is, and you can hear like the use of like classically like dissonant or noisy and things like this kind of effects within the total production. And Benjamin thought you could sort of tease that stuff out. And the other, but the other side of this is that everyone forgets Adorno loved low culture. Um, he loved it, like like clowns, pratfalls, like um, in the culture industry essay, he even talks about why like Betty Boop is kind of like a genius creation yeah. and Donald Duck is a fascist creation. It's like very strange, but like, he's not someone who's like sequestering himself. He's going to the movies and watching the Disney cartoons. He's got, right, he's, he's participating. And I do think that's pretty important. Sorry, it's the No, very quickly, I think, I mean, also in, in the background, of all this and kind of on, on Adam's point, right, is the changing nature of the kind of changing structural conditions of mass culture itself, right? Sort of yeah. the, in their writing, a lot of their, um, their reference would have been to, or part of what they're thinking about is sort of the diminished possibility for an actual avant-garde that occupies a place um, where it does have a kind of um, critical force and the diminution of that rather than sort of mass culture per se. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, before I, I have like two more sort of formal questions, but I just want to say if uh, uh, we're going to have obviously want to have a conversation with everyone. If you have questions or thoughts you want to share, um, line up Mark, uh, our programming director is over there. Uh, so line up with Mark and he'll get you a microphone so you can ask a question. Um, okay. Uh, so the second thing that actually 
is really interesting to me is that when we were putting this together, like I thought like I was going to be mass media guy, you were going to be architecture, you're going to uh, be uh, music and letters, uh, you, uh, sort of more popular music, you were going to be more classical music and, and Izzy was going to be doing um, like plastic art in my mind, right? Um, but it, I only realized like coming in today, we all actually uh, have backgrounds in music. And I am curious to ask what we think is the, like, right, Adorno was a composer, right? Um, uh, and a music student, like, what is the importance of music as the central form being interrogated versus plastic art, literature, uh, film, photography, et cetera, if you think there's any at all? Sorry, and this is, again, general. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 It's you, but it's really you. God. Oh, I mean, I was hoping I would have a, a, a second to think instead of just like, um, but no, um, you know, you're just gonna have to deal with whatever horrifying thoughts come out of my head. But uh, I mean, I mean, again, I'm sort of, I'm very much in the world of like the text that I'm studying for this uh, late style course, but um, something that Edward Said says in the book on late style is he says, he says, like the late Beethoven, Adorno is a figure of superannuation that he sees in particularly like Adorno's understanding of the late Beethoven, a way of kind of grappling with himself, with his own position in the world. Um, and I mean, certainly for Adorno, I mean, part of the significance of music is that, uh, you know, again, like it is, it is still imminent, it's still part of the world, but like no other art approaches so close to, to pure form. Uh, no art in some ways has such a kind of counterfactual uh, capacity. Uh, language is to some extent kind of always, it is representing something, it is speaking of something beyond itself. Um, and this is, of course, this very old tradition in German philosophy is that music and, um, I mean, for like, like for Schopenhauer, music is metaphysics. Music kind of shows us the mirror of the will. And, you know, Adorno would never put it that way, but he does see in music that um, that sort of, capacity to look beyond what surrounds us, to look beyond um, the kind of immediate uh, kind of ideolo ideological conditions that kind of shape our perception of the world around us. And so I think for, to the extent that Adorno is a formalist, which as I said, is a very complicated question, um, and, and that it is music's kind of capacity to be this kind of almost direct visceral experience that is not discursive, but is kind of um, sort of immediate um, that attracts him to it. Yeah, I, I, it's a wonderful way of putting it, I think. And I would just add something else, which is that, of course, um, it's partly because art, uh, music is, you know, as I think Walter Pater said, um, you know, that all art, you know, aspires to the condition of music. So it's clearly about the centrality of music as this, as you said, this kind of pure, pure form, this, um, rep oh, sorry, is that, is that working? So, oh, sorry about that. Um, no, I was just echoing uh, Nathan on uh, why music, you know, was 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 paramount uh, for figures like Adorno, and obviously it has to do with the relationship of uh, music to um, Western, especially in this case German uh, aesthetic culture. The idea of of of, um, of uh, music being the uh, you know the ultimate art form, the repository of a, of a potential uh, transcendence of materiality. Um, but I also think there's a, there's a political uh, dimension to it as well, even if it's only unconscious, um, which is that music um, in Germany and also in the United States is at one and the same time uh, the most transcendent or potentially transcendent of art forms and the most tainted and compromised by its relationship to uh, racial bigotry. Um, in, in the States, of course, it's the disfiguring force of white supremacy. And the fact that the entire, you know, that the, you know, the American musical industry to a large extent originates in things like minstrelsy and the theft of black music. 
commodification of black music. We're still living that history. And um, in Germany, uh, it's the history, obviously, of anti-Semitism and the fact that Wagner uh, was not simply um, a proto-Nazi anti-Semite in his spare time, but he, ins he, ins he inscribed anti-Semitism in his own understanding and theory of, of music and, and arguably in the work itself. So I think that, you know, it's that conflicted nature of, of music which makes it so important to figures like Adorno. Um, uh, I suppose to keep conversation interesting, I'll offer a, uh, a counterpoint in defense of, of the architectural, which I've been thinking a lot about recently, and I for and I forget who who it is that that said it may have been Tafuri or someone writing about Tafuri who said something to the effect of um, of all of the arts sort of architecture um, is the one that shares a seam with the economic um, in its in the sort of um, uh, like as a practice it is kind of the the most closely linked to um, like raw extraction right of economic resources um, to questions of property. Um, and maybe to bring this back to our discussion about social media as, as well, one of the things that's really interesting that's kind of happening in the world of, of um, that's particularly consequential for architectural criticism is the way that, um, you know, sites like in the priority of the visual in a lot of this commentary, right, through not just sites like, like social media sites like Instagram, but also any number of, you know, design, design boom, this kind of like epidemic of, um, so the, something calling itself criticism that is in fact, um, uh, ad, that is either advertising or just kind of the spectacle of beautiful images. Um, and the consequences of that for this, this particular feature of architecture in terms of understanding it as kind of sharing the scene with the economic is something that, you know, is, is troubling and yeah, we're <laughs> very much worth addressing. Yes, very much. Yeah, I wrote a series of essays mid-pandemic calling this phenomenon P architecture because it took on a particularly insidious form during the pandemic, which was kind of like corona washing, by which, uh, or I called it corona grifting, which is worse, uh, by which architects, yeah, by which architects and designers essentially took the crisis of the day, which is a popular form of PR architecture, whether it's climate change, whether it's bigotry, whether it's coronavirus, and they made like basically dumb art for PR about it. And when I say dumb, so yeah, exactly. So when I say dumb art, I mean, some of this was really dumb. Like, <laughs> like there was one instance where uh, Burger King invented like a giant Burger King crown that would be the diameter of social distancing. And all of this was on design, all of this was on design, boom. Architects were being like, here's a proposal for a pop-up hospital. It's just a rendering, there's no plan. Um, and all of this is just about the visual, right? And it's all of this is about a kind of cultural production that prioritizes attention over sort of all other things. But what makes this interesting, this P architecture is like Issy said, is that architecture more than any other art is completely tethered to the material world. We inhabit architecture in a way that we don't with sculpture, with literature, even with music. And I, I mean, I studied architectural acoustics from a, like a historical critical perspective. And even when we are inhabiting like a concert hall, for example, like that is like completely imbued with it, with the, you know, all of the ethics of society, whether it's ticket prices, whether it's hierarchical seating, whether it's the, you know, preference for certain genres of music over others. I mean, there is no architecture without ideology, even architecture for, for pleasure. And that ideology, as I said, in like the housing question is completely, if not stripped of aesthetics, uh, it's become, it's come, yeah, exactly. And so, but what's interesting about P architecture is that it is a fundamental separation of architecture from architecture, architecture from building, uh, because it takes a lot of effort to make a building. It not only takes a lot of effort in terms of the planning, in terms of the materiality, in terms of, because most buildings now are actually just like highly coordinated and highly stratified uh, kind of instruments by which architecture is done 
through a very stratified process of labor. It's not the like some sole genius creating it. It's an office board of, full of 40 unpaid interns like drawing screws in Revit. And like, this is like the ugly part of architecture that we don't see. We see either the finished building, which is completely divorced from its in, you know, generative process, which requires labor, whether it's construction labor or the labor of architecture, or we see the glossy rendering, which is immaterial. And it's much easier if you are making architectural production to produce images and to produce drawings and to produce theory, which is really not theory at all, but kind of advertorial, um, than it is to produce a building which is inherently rooted in the world, which is, and because it's a material thing, it is subject to the forces of commodification and reification that Adorno et al. really talked about. Um, and so I guess, I always find this kind of criticism extremely relevant <laughs> because, because architecture doesn't necessarily have the same excuses of transcendence that other arts have. And I think the closest it gets personally is the concert hall uh, or the church, where, wherein like the, the use of a building is in some, like the experience of being in that building and what it's used for and is connected with something beyond architecture, right? That intersects either religion or another art or something. And this is a very common opinion and it is just an opinion. Um, but yeah, just to, to, to back off of that. I never know how to end my answers. It's like, fun. I'm like, a, I'm a, my husband calls me a rambler. Like, a, like, you know, like the houses, like a ranch house, just rambling. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. I mean, it's funny that uh, we gravitated, even with my prompt about music, we gravitated both to music and architecture. Of course, uh, again, sort of almost rehearsing the Adorno Benjamin debate, right? Like, because like, Benjamin's earliest arguments were about ruins and things like this, and his and his final works on unfinished are, of course, the arcades, the passage and work, right? About sort of passing through these things. And I think one thing that maybe could be a bridge between these two different sort of ways of thinking, and they're both not the sort of standard, like if you read Kant, he does talk about music and it's a sort of visceral experience, but mostly it's about, in fact, it's very funny. I had a, I had a theory professor, um, Susan Buck Morris back in the day, and she would show pictures of what Kant was talking about. And it was actually really, really boring shit. It would be like <laughs> seashells and like really bad wallpaper and like very, very poor paintings. Um, but it's mostly visual, right? The language of aesthetic thought was so visual. And it's interesting that um, here, when we're thinking critical theoretically or whatever, um, we gravitate towards these, these sort of um, forms of aesthetic expression that are more visceral, I guess? Spatial. Spatial, yeah. That you either learn from, for Adorno, in this very like confrontational way, almost, and Benjamin in this kind of habituation, right? You're walking through a space and quietly learning what it means. I always joke to my students um, when they're reading the work of art essay that like, if they've figured out by week four, you know, how to get to the bathroom, that's what Benjamin means, right? Yeah. Like you just know where the bathroom is. No, I didn't have to teach it to you. You learned it through the way the building is structured. Um, and I'll just cut myself off there because it looks like people are starting to line up. Is that correct? So why don't, instead of me asking my last, I was going to ask another one about aesthetic judgment, but I bet it will come up in, uh, in audience questions. So Mark, do you have a microphone? Thanks. And do you guys want to take a There's couple a at a time or do you want to do one at a time? Y'all? Uh, I... All right, let's just use this microphone. Yeah, let's grab like two. Hey, everybody. My name is Bob. And uh, hey, Bob. Hey, this has been great. You guys, so contemporary culture and critical theory. Um, missed the beginning of the workshop because we were upstairs. But um, yeah, I'm thinking about um, comfort and clarity. Uh, I learned those, I, I've got reinforced with those things so far in, in, in our work here since yesterday and um, everyday life, critical theory. And my everyday life really for really long, like almost 40 years is organizing workers and um, being pretty successful at it. I mean, I do all kinds of training now, right? And, and I just was thinking just from last night when um, Aaron Benvenov said, 
thinking and acting at the same time, yeah. which is organizing. And it's other things too. I mean, I think I'm getting at you guys' commentary and sort of the role of intellectuals and it's changed and it's challenge and it's reality and it's immediacy and it's now. Um, and I just need to experience, need to tell a couple of those things. So I had a meeting this morning uh, online <clears throat> with workers talking about um, becoming strike ready, which is a phrase we're using, strike ready. Okay. Wait, we don't have, the law doesn't let us strike, which is the known part of the next part of the conversation. Well, but we still need to be ready. And so what strike ready then can become or does become is mapping and charting, having a list, knowing everybody that you work with and how they relate to other people and mapping it and writing it and owning that list. And it's, you know, archivable, obviously, but it's also actionable. So, so that kind of, that, that kind of, those discussions are something and, and, I'm, and I'm learning from them. Um, be conscious of ourselves making history, right? Mm -hmm. That's a now thing. I mean, I got that from a mentor a long time ago. <laughs> um, we're actually walking through a Coliseum going to buy clove cigarettes for him because he's a Wesleyan graduate, um, is he? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, U2 was like having a show and we were like, fuck, we don't know what U2 is. You know, we're organizers, you know, it's more important. But um, conscious of ourselves making, how do you feel that now? This is quick. Live by arbitration, die half the time. <laughs> that's, you know, that's critical theory, right? Um, and, and finally, um, this is, this is con contemporary because people are, are striking all over the place in higher ed. It's really important. Young people, Starbucks, all of that. I'm doing trainings with a lot of that stuff. And um, when you win, sometimes you don't, not everybody knows you want, right? And some of these big complex strikes, say, for example, in higher ed is what, is what I'm thinking of. California State uh, Universities, Rutgers, you know, there's, we won. Holy shit, we won. Other people, well, we didn't win. And then, you know, because you didn't get everything, right? And so that's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of critical theory too. In Frankfurt schools, there's limits. We're about, this is about conflict, but it's consensus and compromise too. We need to live another day. And the way to say live another day um, that, that I like is, and it works, is <clears throat> a labor dispute is like going through a bad divorce at the end of which you are still married, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you got to go back to work. And I just want to point to the new school strike because <laughs> um, radicals had something, a great deal to do with it. And, and in terms of coming back to work and saying, hey, everybody, it's cool that we're militants now and we're intellectuals, but it's not the revolution. It's not. It's a contract. And now we have a contract. And, and Tosh Leonard, um, you know, some of you mm -hmm. might know, she, she, she did that stuff. She let people know, you know, that you know, guys, the, the radicality of this isn't to stay out and say we didn't get everything. It's, it's to go back and keep organizing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's critical thinking. That's, uh, I think, okay. critical theory. Um, oh, one other thing is uh, Jameson, because as he mentioned it, I, I use this one. He, I, it's only half baked and I, I got it wrong probably, but he wrote a book about um, all the army, everybody in the army has healthcare, housing, and gets fed all, the, you know, three times a day. So how about we all just be in the army? <laughs> change the army so that we're all in the army and 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 that's challenging and it's stupid right but with people and you think about it, it's like wait a minute no that's we're talking about the role of of government and role of each other that the you know universal army i think it was really bad and i didn't like reading much of it zizek was in there and i, I backed away from him by then but anyway um yeah 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 i think we got all right sorry. yeah we got no it's good yeah yeah there's a lot to work with yeah, there sorry i, I want to no, no, it's great, Bob. Um, Thanks, Bob. Maybe we'll grab one more and I'll put these together as a pair of questions. One more question? Serious? Da -da. Um, yeah, I just had a, so I, uh, I worked in like mainstream, you know, American politics for a long mm -hmm. time. And so my, what I would say is ask you about values. Like you're making, there's a lot of theory here, like generalizations about people and stuff, but values like in american life people have different values like some people just believe that that art for example musicians there's some musicians just want to make a lot of money they don't care sure. so much about you know altruism or sure. their art they just you know the, the industry says if you want to make this money you sing this stuff or painters or it applies to all forms of art so there's the commodification of art there's um and then there's artists who believe in political action. You know, they have values. They believe in the common man okay, and woman. They want to fight against the system, what have you. And so what I would say is that each, for art, 
each artist has values of their own. The consumer has values of their own. And that's just how maybe things play out. Um, if you want to make a lot of money, if you want to, you know, uh, play that game, you ultimately have to conform to the industry and what the industry demands and popular consumer, you know, what they want. Um, so how does values play out okay. for what you're doing? Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of maybe summarize these into questions for us all. Um, so I guess the first one is about the relationship between like formal labor, uh, imagination and critical theory, um, which is an interesting set of questions. Uh, and the second is about um, values, generalizations and art as commerce and art as politics. So who has thoughts and feelings? So the funny thing about me is I'm married to a guy who is like the anti-cultural criticism guy. He's like, like, he's like a mathematician. He's a mathematician and he writes like really theoretical mathematical models of the economy from like a Marxian perspective. He is like the anti-Adorno guy. Uh, and yeah, I, I know it's why we're married. It's an odd couple, you know, but it works. But anyways, like... I often run into these debates at home about, and they're spirited and lively and pleasant debates. Uh, my husband's a very nice guy. Uh, very, <laughs> he's quiet, you know, but anyways, digression about what, okay, yeah, you're writing this thing, right? But like, what does it mean for everybody who is not you and everybody who doesn't read The Baffler, you know? Uh, and, you know, there's a common understanding of, of crit cultural criticism as a retreat from practice, which, I mean, even Adorno in like his essay on, res on resignation kind of accepts as like a, as a something that can be debated. Uh, but I think that essay is actually one of his most gentle and poetic essays. And in that he makes the idea that like, yes, there's always going to be praxis. Um, and there's always going to be theory, but the idea that theory has to provide instructions for praxis misunderstands the point of theory, which is that like theory is funny in that it can still be right, even though praxis goes wrong. And I think we see this more often on the left than probably yeah. anywhere else. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But you know, this is not a novel point to make. He's not necessarily arguing for the you know, separation of theory and praxis, but just as a way of saying that the purposes of both are not necessarily shared. And I think when we're talking about the cultural turn, part of the reason I'm, like I said, I'm you know, privileged to live in and work in architecture, which has real world applications to people's lives. Like architecture is included in why the rent is high. It's included why things cost more money. It's included in like the drudgery of work. It's included in, uh, you know, school. Like we, we live our lives in architecture. Exactly, development, real estate, all of these things, all of these things intersect architecture. So like this makes it my answer really easy. <laughs> um, but in terms of labor right now, like architecture is undergoing a revolution in which it's starting to understand itself, not as like, the kind of refuge of these soul geniuses or like this thing that is a devotion to bettering the world, but as like, a, you know, these architecture firms are essentially capitalist enterprises and they are run by capitalist enterprises, which includes like, again, really divided labor. I mean, you, they're, the guy drawing on the napkin on the you know top suite of the building is not the guy who puts the building together. It's not the thousands of guys who put things together or even the engineer or the contractor or, or the developer or anything. And architects are starting to kind of realize like, wait, I was sold an idea of what this was in school that it isn't. And so they're actually starting to try and unionize. Um, and this is like a real discrete conflict between what is taught in architecture school as like being some kind of self-sacrifice, as being some kind of great artist, as being some kind of world changer and like the grueling reality of architectural labor. So it is in this kind of instance where cultural criticism plays actually like I would say quite a key role in that like in realigning the expectations of an artistic field, we are able to, to better the chances of that field's fight for dignity. And I think it works like Adorno and Benjamin and all of these are like instrumental in that. 
I'm actually one of the, I think one of the first, sorry, one of the first books where I encountered uh, the work of the uh, Frankfurt School uh, was a work of labor history, a uh, very powerful book published in the early 1970s by someone who had been a worker himself and had then uh, educated himself in critical theory, um, Stanley Aronowitz's uh, False Promises. Um, and it's a, a study of the American working class, very much informed by Adorno, Marcuse, and, and other figures. But um, you know, on the whole, uh, the Frankfurt School didn't have a, a lot to say about working class struggles or trade unions. Um, and in fact, um, uh, Herbert Marcuse uh, became in the 1960s very much associated um, with a movement of left-wing thinkers who you could say gave up on the Western working class and regarded it as having been incorporated into the system and projected their hopes instead on students, on technical workers, information industry workers, and on the wretched of the earth of what was then called uh, the third world. Um, uh, but, you know, it occurs to me, you know, I, I, it occurred to me while I was listening to um, that uh, disquisition earlier about, um, about organizing um, that the culture industry um, doesn't really have much of a place for working class struggles. Um, there, you know, are occasionally, you know, there are pieces in the New York Times, of course, um, on labor um, uh, now and then, but I was talking recently to a friend of mine who is a labor journalist and who told me that it was becoming very difficult for her to do labor stories because they were seen to have a, a, a predictable arc you know, uh, people struggling against um, uh, degrading conditions and either winning or not winning uh, their, their, their strikes. And uh, this, the journal that she was uh, writing for was less and less interested in them. And I thought, you know, it's, it is quite striking that there, there is, there has always been and continues to be a place for uh, long form journalism on the subject of poverty but not on the subject of working class experience and working class struggles. Um, when you think of some of the books that have really um, shaped our imagination about class um, in America, they've, on the whole, they've been about poverty. They've been, they've been books like uh, Michael Harrington's The Other America or uh, Barbara Ehrenreich's uh, Nickel and Dimed, uh, or more recently, Matthew Desmond's book um, on evictions. Um, as much as I admire Stanley Aronowitz's book, um, it does not have that kind of kind of kind of standing. Um, what was the other question? Because I wanted to say something about that. Uh, just question of oh, about values. values. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm 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 actually not. I'm not really. Um, I don't really accept the framing of the question, which strikes me as quite quite um, quite binary. I, I actually don't think there. I mean, I don't want to live in a world where we're forced to choose between uh, uh, artists who are, you know, selling out just to make it and, uh, you know, Billy Bragg, you know, writing, you know, virtuous songs about noble proletarian struggles that, that probably sell okay, but that frankly on an, aesthetic, on an aesthetic level are not very interesting. In fact, you know, I mean, I would argue that some of the, uh, some of the writers um, who have really revolutionized prose have either had no values, have been nihilists, or have had values that are entirely contrary to my own. I mean, I think of uh, people like people like Céline, you know, who did something to the French sentence, and then of course went on to become a horrible collaborator, or you know, to choose a, a you know a less sulfurous figure, but one who you know was guilty of a major crime. He killed his wife, uh, William Burroughs. Um, uh, you know, the his um, you know his work is um, is is enormously innovative. So I don't really think that values um, are, are that critical. I, I would say that, you know, that art is a way of, of, of thinking about form, thinking about the place of form in the world, thinking about the world, and it's about expression. You know, I mean, th those seem to me much more important than the question of values.
Can I add something? Yeah, yeah. I just want to add something uh, quickly to Adam's last point is, um, I mean, I guess values can mean different things. Uh, if we're talking about aesthetic values, it's a different question. But if we're talking about art as kind of primarily an expression of political or social values, um, I think what, you know, the Adornian response would be that in some sense, both of those things, that is to say art that is an expression of political values and art that it is a commodity are in some ways fundamentally working on the same plane. They are a vision of art that is instrumental, that is kind of about accomplishing an end um, beyond itself. And um, I think maybe a sort of paradox of the way he would think about art is that if art is, even if like those values are conceived as liberatory, art that is geared toward those values as a means toward their end cannot free us. Um, it is only through the extent to which the art can itself be autonomous, be free from, from those instrumental values, whether commercial or kind of in a narrow sense, political, that it can also be freeing for us. Uh, yeah, I also took the, the question about values to be sort of a question more about taste, you know, insofar as you were talking, uh, what was sort of being discussed were preferences. Um, and in that case, I mean, in this sense of value, sometimes I almost feel as though value pluralism in the taste sense of values is is so often invoked as a as a way to excuse oneself from the from the from the from the burden of kind of judging a, a piece of work as a result of which you get people saying that you know um at, right yeah yeah but i like it or like nft art is just as art as you know this this like you know, sure yeah like as caravaggio right so and I think that there are there are kind of the 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 reticence about making value judgments like that has sort of all sorts of structural reasons that that account for that. Um, but it's one that I think a kind of the, the kind of thing that I think a, a sort of a, a fearless critical theory is sort of you know needs needs to be able to take on. Um, and then on on Bob's point, um, I've been thinking a lot about the way that. Um, uh, labor movements are, are are kind of held or passed over by institutional memory. Um, you know, academia doesn't have institutional memory. I think one of the problems in in a lot of the kind of academic labor organizing is this question of how do you, when everyone leaves every four years, actually preserve um, this the 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 strategy and the tools and the tactics of of collective organizing in this way and we should also pay attention to the way that that labor itself um is uh you know is depicted in different cultural media i mean there's a um, there are reasons why there aren't as many films about labor strikes um as there were you know even in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, and there are relatively few, there are notable, but relatively few instances of kind of labor as kind of the subject of, of other art forms. So I'm thinking, I mean, a beautiful example of this is kind of Julia Wolf's um, labor trilogy. Most recently she wrote a beautiful operetta about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, but these are the kinds of things I think of as exceptions. And so we should really pay attention to how labor as a subject gets taken up or or ignored in, in or yeah, or absolutely erased in, 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 in um, uh, aesthetic media. Um, quickly, uh, I'll try my best to be quick. Uh, I'll also try my best not to get in trouble. Um, because, uh, actually the president of the Brooklyn Institute Social Research Board, um, is a longtime veteran of the American labor movement, both the formal AFL, CIO, and also sort of what's now called alt labor, which is like people who try to work in, um, not already unionized sectors and often with, for example, like mi migrant labor or sectors that you wouldn't think about like academia or tech and things like that. And something that's really interesting, I don't wanna like put her on the spot, but what, something that's really interesting about that is that she was not trained as a labor organizer. Um, she did not come up through like a factory system. She does come from a coal town, but she's a, a filmmaker by profession. And uh, often is, is uh, laments to me about the sort of disconnect and the way in which she 
uh, uh, bristles as a West Virginian uh, coal family person at the way in which it is assumed that serious filmmaking is like beyond the grasp of her people. <laughs> um, and that, uh, you know, it's, on, it's only, yeah, Burger King and, uh, and Disney, right? Um, and there are some pretty like gross leftists who actually buy this kind of trash as well but like there's nothing uh, the joke i like to make is there's nothing too shitty for the working class right uh, it's an old labor movement joke which is like there's nothing too good for the working class like all the luxuries we have should be everyone's uh and this gets turned around with some sort of this certain forms of left populism where it becomes well everyone actually wants an infinity pool and and the war and a mcmansion exactly um, and I, I think that that's like a fundamentally, like, it's a really fundamental question um, that gets, that does in fact connect labor and critical theory. I mean, the irony for me of knowing this history very well is that for the first 10 years of the Frankfurt School, they were actually a labor history archive <laughs> um, under uh, Grunberg's leadership. Um, and some of the lesser figures who I always like to bring up, people like Franz Neumann, people like Otto Kirchheimer, were deeply involved in uh, the labor movement, labor organizing, uh, much less so, obviously, people like Adorno and Horkheimer, especially. Um, and it's funny, when I think about questions like that, I often turn uh, to thinkers like uh, who aren't critical theory, frankly, uh, something like Jorsky's Capitalism and Social Democracy, which I feel like is not read as much today as it should be, uh, does in fact have a reflection on Adorno and Horkheimer at the very beginning and on Luxembourg, and I think in one of the critical thinkers at the end. But there in that sort of text is this interplay of the sort of success and failure of the limitations of the labor only model and all that. Um, and in fact, in the 60s and 70s, if you read really early Donna Haraway, actually like way early Donna Haraway, she actually records um, like all these different movements that are labor movements that were engaging with new left and um, critical theoretical ideas. So that's, up to, so that's like sort of the, the labor question for me. The other one, I think other people have already sort of said it, like, I think actually one of the things that I would say about critical theory and values is, is almost reverses the dilemma, right? The, it's, the values aren't set in stone, right? The argument is that they're always in flux, but when we record them, let's say we take a poll or a survey and say, oh, 52% of people like the summer blockbuster, that means it's a winner, right? Like as if that's a fixed thing in time and as if that doesn't have dynamic interrelations with other aspects of society. And to me, and this comes up so much, frankly, Izzy, when we're chatting on our podcast, um, the really fun bits are when you find like pop culture that is accidentally very politically successful. We, uh, News is a great example. Um, we talked about this with the fucking Andor TV show. Like, or like the other thing is you sometimes encounter filmmakers like Raoul Peck who like get these like blank checks to make like, like Lumumba movies, right? That are like amazing or HBO specials, right? So you do end up encountering these weird things in, in mass culture. And sometimes the, what'd you say? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Perfect, exactly, a great point. Um, and often it's like the most, for, often the like, quote unquote, political art can be the most formulaic and banal of all art. Um, and so like, to me, that's what gets the gears turning when I'm thinking about critical theory and commerce and sort of like politics today. Any other final thoughts? Because we're getting close to time. Oh, yes, ma'am. So I just want to mention, is anybody here paying attention to the competition, the physical competition between Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos? And what does that say about late capitalism and ultra rich people who should be doing more important things with their time, which would be beneficial to lots and lots of people? And clearly, if 
if Jeff, <laughs> if if they have time to work and sculpt their bodies like this, whereas I've I've heard that Mark Bezos is the people who are making fifteen dollars an hour, whatever it is, they can't even take bathroom breaks because they're Jeff, they're like yeah, the but the bottles and um the women have to wear multiple underwears, so so it, it's like in these it's. It's outrageous, and, and and if athleticism is supposed to involve good sportsmanship or sports personship, what I, I don't think they possess that really. And I just wanted to make that remark. And, <laughs> yeah, one last question. And then I give this back. Thank you. Um, so my question is maybe specifically about architecture, um, but you know I'd like to hear from anyone. But maybe for the sake of time, I'll direct it to Kate specifically. Um, so, you know, in addition to the horizon of like socialization of housing, there is, I guess, for lack of better terms, like a leftist um, aesthetic critique in the, def or, you know, of development or gentrification, right? You hear a lot, oh, these beautiful brownstones are being destroyed by these drab, minimalist, sans serif, you know, buildings and storefronts. <laughs> um, but of course, I think like you pointed out, there's this very strong uh, reactionary aesthetic concern, like these identity Europa type, oh, we must return, we must preserve the Greco-Roman marble or whatever. Um, and so I'm curious if there's a way of using critical theory to think like around this tension of this kind of preservationist impulse, right? This framing of anti-development as a way of preserving local cultural heritage of the city, of the neighborhood and so forth. Um, if there's a way of maybe separating the defense of human creativity and artistic endeavor, in this case, like uh, color, ornament, these things from this maybe inherently conservative defense of cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious how you or how anyone might think through this tension in architecture or maybe other artistic mediums as well. I just want to answer that concisely. Um, I just wrote like a 5,000 word essay about this, which I will not speak 5,000 words about right now. Um, but the thing, the interesting thing about the aesthetic question as it relates to housing is that a lot of the times like these aesthetic judgments are not rooted in material reality. Um, and so for example, like if you want to look at architecture, like first of all, you have to understand that architecture is uh, inextricably linked to housing. It's inextricably linked to like any building, whether it considers itself architectural or not. Because in, you know, the first ever text of architectural theory is uh, of Vitruvius who wrote that architecture is like has the triad of firmness, commodity, and delight, which is to say like durability, usability, and aesthetic uh, worth. Uh, this is actually like so stable that it kind of still holds up. But right now, like I feel like a lot of the times when we consider this question, if we want to turn the word commodity on its head for a second to mean what it means in like a Marxian sense, it's like that triangle becomes extremely unequal um, and imbalanced. And so what happens is, is the, we have to first ask why do buildings look the way that they do? Like that, that's the most important question. And so for a lot of the times when we're talking about like new build buildings, the things that are like people have real aesthetic concerns with, the reason those buildings look the way they do is not because they are some kind of uh, like architect's vision of, or dream or something like this in the way that we talk or narrativize architectural production. Uh, but the reason they look like that is because they're cheap. Like they have to be, they have to be economically produced to extract maximum profit. And as a result, like also it's a result of stratification of architectural labor. Like they use materials, for example, hardy board, aluminum paneling, all of these other things because they are highly indexed and accessible to like what is a very plug and play computerized version of architecture. And so if you're trying to churn out as many buildings as possible to make profit as an architecture firm, it behooves you to use these kinds of prefabricated or uh, otherwise cheap systems. And so all of this comes to work together as to why those buildings exist at the way that they are. Uh, you cannot just like make an aesthetic judgment without understanding the process by which architecture comes into the world we build for the world that we make and in terms of like the right wing critique of that i mean it's really funny to me that like the right wing is just like roman statue guys now um yeah that's a that's a more complicated one i mean that really is it's literally like nazism <laughs> 
<laughs> like I'm, we're, we're not being like, we're really not being like hyperbolic when we say that this aesthetic consideration is, is walking the exact same path that the degenerate art debate that kicked Walter Bauhaus or Walter Gropius and the Bauhaus out of Germany and into America where they all became capitalists. Like the, so this is just like a very simple, simply dismissed because it's been dismissed not only by like a bunch of architectures, but also by Adorno. And even Adorno took on like the Bauhaus too. In fact, he was the first, like before the postmodernists did populism. He was like, he was the guy who was like, actually all these rationalist modernist stuff is like actually just ornament also. And he was the first guy to say that ever. And then like they, the postmodernists asked that they invented it anyways. So I guess that is like the, that is the, um, the really short and long of it. Um, yeah, those Roman statue guys, that is just like some basic like weird Volk kind of kind of thing. But the reason we don't build like that anymore has nothing to has also everything to do with labor. Because like all of that customization and ornament took tremendous labor to to produce. And this was something that was remarked about even by like Edmund Burke, who said that like the monumentality of architecture is dependent on the effort it takes to produce it. He was talking about Gothic cathedrals, but the sentiment stands. And so we don't have that kind of labor anymore because everything is made piecemeal. And even when we're mass producing, uh, when we were mass producing, for example, architectural ornament in the 19th century, uh, we were doing it in a way that like we would make wood look like stone, wood look like cornices. And this was done in a factory setting. Those things fell out of fashion. We don't need to do them anymore, et cetera. They, you can get moldings and stuff like that made out of fiber cement or concrete or something. It's not like they disappeared, but we can't make them in the way that we did one because we exhausted the stone quarries in the 19th century doing it the first time. And two, because it's not economical in like a purely sense, but you have to divorce that economic analysis from the revanchist sort of right wing framing of it. And just to touch on like Jeff Bezos and them fighting each other. I also work as a sports journalist and I think one of the most incisive things that Adorno said about sport was that like when mass culture imitates sport, it's not, it's not imitating the deeds of the sportsman or the athleticism of the sportsman. It's imitating the rabid fans in the stands. Just to just want to underscore your point that a lot of the sort of trad architecture stuff is we are um, it is absolutely a mistake to engage it on 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 any aesthetic grounds and to to engage it as though it is a form of aesthetic criticism itself because it's not. It's, not. it's literally just like what like things are better when women stay at home. Yeah, I just want to uh, quickly add, just again add echo and add on what. Um, Kate and Izzy both just put out there. Uh, first on the the Zuck versus Musk, uh, which I believe Elon uh, bast, backed out of, but I do think this is really a like, it, it both on the sort of, I want to do it like identification and then sports, like with the weird personal identification with these figures, which is even greater again than the robber baron era. Like, I don't think a lot of people in the robber baron era walked around being like, yo, Carnegie, he's my boy. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like that I don't Play think was a real it. thing. And today we do have it. Um, and it actually, believe it or not, I find this deeply related. All right. I, I mean, the thing is these guys actually, look, the truth of the matter, so they, uh, the bare, the bare facts, one of them challenged the other one to like a physical a contest of, of um, a, cage. a cage match, a fight. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been like, posting yeah. pictures of himself, like training and ripped and then Musk by, backed out. But that's a, actually, the, it's cut, the details are kind of immaterial because this whole thing is insane. Um, actually, both on the level of identification. Elon subsequently proposed a, liter a literal dick measuring contest with a little ruler. In oh my God. Because it's time. too perfect. Like the reason it's like too perfect and it, it actually does connect to the question about con conservationism and conservatism because uh, like when uh, Zuck, I know, if, I know a guy who used to work at Facebook, when he gets on Instagram, he is mimicking that aesthetic to a T, which is, of course, as Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, all would argue, it's a myth. That's one of the things critical theory helps us with, which is like, 
the people who post that kind of like Vox Europa bullshit, like on the internet, which is by the way, very successful, right? Are posting, they don't want to talk about like, Greek sexual practices. They don't want to talk about uh, political forms and their multiplicity in that time. Um, I mean, they don't want to talk about any of this shit. They have a, a um, what's uh, a statis? It's a, it's a simulacrum that the Baudrillard, I was thinking of Stadis Gregorius, they have an autoscopic orientalism. They ironically are projecting back on themselves a myth of European civilization that never fucking existed. So I actually think about the lock. Students raise this question of, of Adorno especially, and, and is he just doing the Schopenhauer jam? And my answer usually is no. Um, and we can debate, you know, Nathan and I have, Rebecca and I have about things like romanticism and things like this, but fundamentally uh, the Adorno thing is, is not an either or, it's not new or old. It's that like, once you lose guarantees in history, you are now forced to take on different criteria for judgment. Right, so if I'm not just plowing ahead and I'm promised the revolution, now all of a sudden I actually have to take seriously, shit, some of the stuff I left behind might be good, some of the stuff I left behind might be the worst, and some of the stuff that I don't see or that is marginal might in fact just be as valuable as, I don't know, the fucking Colosseum. Anyone else? All right, well, on that note, thanks. Uh, and the next panel starts at four o'clock, I believe. <laughs>